Welcome to The Trauma Teacher, the podcast dedicated to transforming therapists into masterful healers with confidence, creativity, and clarity. I'm Janice Holland, and I'm here to guide you through the journey of becoming the therapist you've always envisioned, helping you step into your full potential and make a profound impact on your clients' lives. Each week, we'll explore powerful strategies, share inspiring stories, and dive deep into the tools and mindsets you need to elevate your practice and create lasting change for both you and your clients. Whether you're a seasoned professional or just starting out, The Trauma Teacher is your go-to resource for overcoming challenges, embracing your unique healing artistry, and thriving in your career without sacrificing your well-being. So if you're ready to become the confident, creative healer you were meant to be, you're in the right place. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of The Trauma Teacher. Today, we're going to talk about why our clients believe that they're bad or they have this underlying core belief system that there's something wrong with them, that they're a bad apple, that they God hates them, they deserve bad things. Um, And a lot of times you'll ask them why, and maybe they can give a few examples of something that happened or something somebody said to them, but there's not like this really clear reason, like why they believe that they, they typically might say, well, you know, bad things just always happen to me or always have happened to me. So there must be something about me that's different and wrong. Um, Sometimes you'll get that, but a lot of times it's just this kind of this pervasive Um, belief system that they've created this paradigm that they uh, operate from that that insists that there's something wrong with them and that they're bad so I want to talk about why that is somebody who comes from a background of adverse life experiences who comes from a background of trauma then um, there's a very clear reason why this is the case and if we're not uh, if we don't understand it and are not clear on it, then our treatment approaches can be messy and can be like we can kind of dance around it, but not actually get to the core of what the problem is, which just prolongs them um, in their pain and suffering, prolongs them in their belief that they're different or wrong or bad or disconnected, that kind of thing. So we're going to go into that today. So let's first start by talking about the locus of control. So locus of control is... Um, it's normal for their locus of control to be internal for a child between the ages of two and seven. So like if you look at Piaget's stages of development, um, the child believes that they cause and control everything that happens around them in the world. That's what kind of the definition of locus of control is the cause, the control center. So if I'm between the ages of two and seven, I believe that the world revolves around me. I cause everything that's happening around me. Um, It's very normal. And then as we mature and grow out of that stage of development, we begin to understand that there are lots of things happening around us, um, lots of decisions people make that don't have anything to do with us. We can't control them. Um, There are some things that we can also control. So like a a person who has been able to mature into adulthood from a very uh, grounded place is going to be able to understand the ambiguity in that and accept it for what it is and um, move forward. So what happens with somebody who has experienced some adverse life experiences or trauma is the when those experiences happen, especially in childhood, even if they're beyond the ages of two and seven, it's very overwhelming. It's very helpless. There's an incredible amount of suffering and pain involved and it creates disconnection. And disconnection is absolutely intolerable to us as humans, especially because we're mammals. So if you look at mammals in the animal kingdom, they all have to have connection to survive. They all are, you know, are in packs. And uh, the babies, it's different numbers of years for different kinds of mammals, but babies can't just be born and be on their own. There's a period of time where they have to have uh, some protection and connection in order to survive and stay alive. And for mammals, that age is 12. So anything that might happen to threaten your connection before the age of 12, then that's intolerable and it feels like life or death. So what happens if we've experienced these, you know, if we're experiencing a divorce, a a messy divorce with our parents and they're, you know, maybe they're blaming and shaming each other and putting you in the middle and creating double binds, or maybe you have a family member who's hurting you in some way and it's threatening your connection or you're being really bullied at school or 
you know, there's all kinds of things that we can experience that creates, that threatens our safety, it threatens our connection, it threatens our connection to our family systems, it creates a threat to the community with which we're operating. And it also threatens our connection to ourself because when our nervous system is dysregulated from an event and we're not able to make sense of that event and calm it down, that is the definition of trauma and that is disconnection. And when our nervous system is dysregulated, our mind and body split and kind of stop operating as one unit in order to, and and it goes into full blown survival. Um, And then once, you know, in a, in a situation where maybe our nervous system is threatened, once we're able to calm our nervous system back down and re-regulate in a, in a healthy person, they're going to be able to reconnect their mind and body and continue to move forward. So compounding trauma or really big, big trauma um, that may not be happening over a period of time, but something really big, it can cause the dysregulation, the split, and then we're unable to re-regulate. We're unable to really fully make sense of what happens. So this is kind of what I'm talking about, an experience like that from a complex trauma survivor or somebody who's experienced something really so big and overwhelming that they're not able to recreate, they're not able to reestablish safety for themselves. So what do we do if we are experiencing something where we feel completely helpless, completely disconnected, it feels like life or death because it is life or death for a child, and we have no control over anything that's happening. The locus of control is completely outside of us. That's an impossible situation to be in. But we are so clever as humans that we have to come up with a way to maintain or establish some sense of safety out of survival because our our bodies are wired for survival, right? So the way we do that is we shift the locus of control from outside of us to inside of us. We shift from, I'm not in control of anything to I'm in control of everything. And the way we make that shift is by determining that we deserve what's happening, that we are to blame for what's happening. So my parents are getting a divorce because I'm a naughty kid and they are fighting all the time because they don't know what to do with me or they're fighting all the time because they don't have enough money to afford me or they're fighting all the time because I don't keep my room clean or because I, I, um, broke a dish at dinner. Like though, you know, like it doesn't, it's not necessarily rational, but we come up with reasons why, or my family member is hurting me or abusing me because I'm bad, or this is what I deserve, or I don't know, like, again, it's not rational, but we'll come up with a reason to shift the locus of control to, to make it internal, to make it us, to make it our fault. And this resolves the conflict. And there's actually some peace that comes with it because it's like, okay, now my world makes sense. Now I know why all of this is happening because it's just because I'm bad. I can figure out later how to fix that. Now I can calm down and maintain connection with my family, maintain connection with my community um, and with myself. And it feels like things are going to be okay from there, from there forward. The problem obviously is, is there is an incredible amount of pain and grief that gets trapped inside this paradigm that's formed. So I think of the paradigm as like this ball and inside the ball we trap all the grief and the pain and the helplessness and we cover it over it sounds like my neighbor is remodeling sorry for the noise and we cover it over with um this protective layer of i'm bad and that i'm wrong and so and we bury this paradigm deep within us so i looked up the word paradigm a paradigm is a framework or pattern of thought that defines how people understand and interpret the world around them. It's their beliefs, their assumptions, their values, their practices. So it's an overarching system of thought that influences thinking and behavior. It is your entire sense of self. So imagine, you don't have to imagine because we see people walking the planet all over the place who have adopted this paradigm and buried it deep within them. And inside that paradigm is an incredible amount of grief and pain and helplessness and suffering, but they've resolved it for now by believing that they deserve what's happened and they're bad. And and that paradigm shift that they've created now informs every decision that they make moving forward and how they're going to interact and operate within the world. It's so powerful. 
So let's talk a little bit about what that looks like. So people who've buried that paradigm shift with that paradigm within them that they're wrong or that they're bad or they're screw up or they're not enough, they're not worthy, you know, people will frame it differently, but that's the general idea of, of what the belief system is. We have two choices. The mind body split still exists. So for some, it's a pretty extreme split because they've had lots of compounding experiences to really reinforce that paradigm and make the walls of it very, very thick. Um, some people, maybe it's less so, but it's still there. We have two choices with the split. We can go into our body. We can act it out. We can be, um, these are people who um, have really big emotions. They act irrationally. A lot of times they can't hold down a job. They struggle with addiction, many of them. They um, kind of just have this screw you, screw the world. I don't care. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to get what I can because uh, I'm not enough anyway. I'm never going to be enough. So why try? You know, they just kind of have this pervasive state of um, uh, kind of a victim, but it, it displays itself in a, in a more emotive way. All right, versus other people who take on more of like a perfectionist role of I, I do believe it's true, but I'm going to do everything in my power to prove that it's not right. So I'm going to be I'm going to please people. I'm going to be a workaholic. I'm overthinking all the time and processing and trying to be in there in their head and and need to know everything that's happened. They can be very over controlling. They're very they're very methodical and they think through everything. They don't like surprises. They don't like going places they haven't been before. They need to be very aware or if they do travel, they want to control the itinerary. Like they're very much in their head. They don't feel a lot of their feelings and um, they are working overtime to prove their worth. All right, so the, if you think of it like a spectrum, some people are way over on the perfectionistic side of the spectrum. They're always in their head. They're always numb. They never really feel. Some people are way over at the other end of the spectrum where they're always acting out and emoting and just causing problems and can't keep, you know, struggle to keep relationships, struggle to keep jobs. You know, they're very, they act out a lot. And then there's a lot of people that fall somewhere in the middle. So if they are tuned in, turned on, they are very much in their head, they're very perfectionistic, they're workaholic, they are very structured, or they're flipped to the other side, the extreme opposite, and, um, you know, the world is crashing down around them, they have these big emotions. So, I mean, this is so common. I, there's so, much, so many of us who really struggle with this. You may see some of yourself in this. I know for me, I'm, I'm a head person. I tend to be somebody who overthinks and not feel my feelings. I've come a long way through my healing, but that's definitely where I started in my journey. Um, and so it's important for us to kind of see within us as the healers, the helpers, the therapists, where we fall, but to recognize that within our clients. So typically when clients come to therapy, it's because these responses are no longer working for them or they're starting to cause more trouble or problems than they're worth. So maybe their addictions have kind of run their course and they're just sick and tired of of uh, what their addictions are costing them or, you know, they have a, maybe a full-blown disorder, a depression, anxiety, OCD, something like that, and they want support and help with their disorder. Um, it could be cutting, it could be eating like they're not eating enough or they're eating too much it could be they have a string of bad relationships so they'll come in with a behavior that they're sick and tired and sick and t you know being sick and tired of um and when we do the intake and we get their histories and there's a significant amount of trauma in the back or even just some trauma in their background then it's so important the reason i'm doing this episode is so we understand the paradigm that exists because if we as therapists begin just addressing behaviors, and again, if they are coming in initially because their behaviors have caused wreaked havoc on their life, then yeah, we need to spend some time in, in the here and now and helping them manage their behaviors. But if you actually wanna move the needle forward in their healing, staying in that space is not what's gonna do it. And staying and then addressing any shame and fear that they feel, that's very important to address, but that's not even the, the inside of the paradigm what's on the inside of the paradigm is grief and helplessness 
and the the sense of innocence that was lost right so it's if we're not helping them connect with the grief of the reality that the locus of control was actually not inside them it was outside them all along as a child um, then we're not actually going to help them move the needle forward so you can have them write mantras recite over and over i'm a good person you can have them list out all the things their positive attributes these are all things i've done with clients by the way so these are not bad things to do i'm just saying if that's as far as we take it like they can chant and chant and chant i'm a good person i'm a good person i'm a good person but it's it's not even going to touch the walls of that paradigm until we get to helping them internalize and accept and tolerate the feelings of grief and helplessness that they have dissociated from and disconnected from understandably so remember as a child it, they were in an impossible situation they created a reality with which they could survive thank god they thought to do that and were able to do that but we have to now they're older they can tolerate the hopelessness they can tolerate the grief they just don't know that they can tolerate it yet they don't know that they can manage that yet and so it's like you know initially it feels like often they say i i can't feel that i'm gonna die if you make me you know if you make me first of all i'm not gonna make you do anything but i'm gonna inspire you try to inspire you to do it for yourself but anyway if if i feel that i'll never come if i go there i'll never come back that i'll end up in a mental hospital for the rest of my life if i have to feel these feelings like they they still are firmly rooted in the belief system that it's a life or death situation because there's still that childlike part of them in there that's trapped inside the paradigm where it was a life or death situation who's still holding it who hasn't had the opportunity to grow up and develop the um you know flex the muscles practice of practicing managing and tolerating emotions and keeping your nervous system regulated at the same time um so this is kind of one of the big keys is helping us feel feelings while we have a regulated nervous system uh, at the same time. And that can be something that it takes somebody quite a bit of time to be able to do, um, depending on how complex the trauma is that they've been through. All right, let me check my notes real quick, make sure I'm ready to move on. Um, yeah, okay, so I have some key steps to healing. The first one is accept the deep pain of realizing you are not the one to blame. You are innocent and deserved protection. So it can take a while for somebody to, to even kind of tiptoe close to this. They will be, um, depending on how complex the trauma is, how fortified the, that paradigm sh shift the, the walls are of self-protection, the self-protective barrier or of I'm bad and I'm wrong. Um, it can be really, really hard for somebody to accept the incredible pain that comes with understanding, actually, I wasn't to blame. I couldn't control this. I was innocent. Um, it's really hard. I think they, it, uh, many clients associate this with feeling weak. This means I'm weak. Um, this means I, you know, like that, that's that helplessness, that childlike helplessness with weakness. Um, so one way I, I try to help my clients see it is by externalizing it. So I'll tell them, you know, if I'm working with a guy, I'll be like, let me tell you a story about a little boy I know. Or if I'm working with a woman, I'll say, let me tell you a story about a little girl I know. And then um, I will kind of tell their story or, sim or a story similar to their story um, and ask them, so is this five-year-old little girl weak because she couldn't? pull that man off of her who was hurting her? Is this little girl weak because she couldn't figure out how to keep her parents married, staying together in the same home? You know, helping them like externalize the story so that they can begin to see it from another point of view sometimes will help kind of um, build a tolerance level for being able to feel that feeling of, um, uh, I lost my train of thought, for, to feel that feeling of innocence, 
and that they deserve protection, right? There's usually anger that comes up with that. Some people are really uncomfortable with anger. People who are usually in their head um, have a hard time connecting with anger, so we may have to help them with that. But just doing a lot of work around accepting the pain of realizing that you weren't to blame, that you were innocent, that you deserve protection, and feeling the grief around that. All right. And then, so that was number one. Number two is grieve. Feel those feelings. Feel the loss of safety. Feel the loss of care. And in this step, it's so important to help them process and grieve what didn't happen as much as what did. And I found that with many of my clients, helping them with what didn't happen is actually where most of the processing needs to happen for them. The protection they didn't receive, the parents who weren't available, the happy, safe home they didn't have, the, um, you know, so the things that they didn't get to have that they perceive as being what should, they should have gotten to have, often they need to grieve just as much or more than what actually did happen to them. All right. And then step three for helping them heal is shift, helping them shift responsibility and getting out of blame to where it belongs. So we're not going to blame the people because blame keeps you in a position of victim. It keeps you on the triangle and I have a whole, a lot of teachings around the triangle. That will be another podcast episode, but basically Cartman's drama triangle is the victim, the persecutor or the rescuer, right? So if in that it's all based on shame, blame, unworthiness, disconnection, it's, it's a disempowered way of living life. So if we're helping them blame the other person that they're, they're staying in a very disempowered, um, victim place, but if we will help them shift responsibility I, and saying things like, I am no longer responsible for the choices you made. I'm no longer responsible for the chaotic home I was in. I am not responsible for um, how my mother couldn't take care of me or the times that my mom hit me or the, the times that my family member abused me. I am no longer responsible. There's no world in which a person of my age would be responsible for those events and I will not hold myself responsible any longer. See how that's like a more empowered way of saying it like they are allowing the person to be empowered by shifting the responsibility to them and they are empowering themselves um, by calling it responsibility versus blame. Okay, so then number four, this can be so challenging because it requires somebody to shift their entire perspective off of that triangle. I'm no longer going to be a victim of my life, but I'm going to be a creator of my life. And I'm going to do that by taking responsibility for myself. So step four is taking from here forward. I take responsibility for myself through love and connection. I will create safety for myself. I will create and find joy for myself. I will create, um, the connections and the relationships that that are healthy for me that are good for me i take responsibility for myself this can be a big big shift for many of our clients it takes quite a bit of time for some to help them to get there but this is the only way to liquidize the paradigm that they've created uh, that's based on that they're bad wrong people into a paradigm, a belief system that they are worthy and they are good and they are deserving because every human's deserving and they get to create any life they want to create. They are fully responsible for doing that. That's the paradigm that they're forming through these steps. All right. And then number five is to continue to invest in tolerating difficult feelings, ambivalence, the loss of time, you know, grieving the loss of time. Um, Many clients, when, when they get to this phase, I know that they've really, and I, and I teach them this too, so they can be very self-aware about this, but I know that they are on the other side of grief. I don't ever say finished with grief because I don't know that we're ever like finished with it. I think there's always, there are always moments where those, those things that have really touched us and hurt us, there will be days where we still need to process it and grieve it a little, but you know, they're on the other side of it when, um, there's some ambivalence present, meaning they can tolerate and accept and feel more than one feeling at the same time. So I was working with a woman recently and um, she had a mom who was very 
harsh and critical, had some narcissistic tendencies, and then she married somebody and was married for a very long time who had a lot of very similar traits. And um, she's no longer with her her partner, and um, she has some communication with her mom, but she was saying in one of the sessions, she said, you know, I still get sad about what happened with my husband and I, and I get, I can, now I get flashes sometimes of some moments that make me really angry when he put me down or make me really sad when he took money from me or, you know, different things that he did. She said, but I can also remember when we would go do things and laugh and she was able to name some very specific things that they did that that was fun, that she enjoyed, that they were able to laugh about. And, um, you know, it. she, and so I was like, okay, she's kind of on the other, she is on the other side of that grief now because she can tolerate all those feelings at one time. She can tolerate the good times and the bad times. She can feel the sadness and the anger and the grief when she needs to, but she can also remember that their relationship was dynamic and complex. Um, so you, you know that your, your client, and it's important for us to help our clients understand, you know, you're kind of on the other side of the grief when you can manage that amb- that ambivalence and helping them, you know, see and feel and understand that it does come, that you can get to this place, especially at the beginning, because they feel like if I start crying, I'll cry forever. And so I'll say to them, like, do you know anybody who's ever started crying and just never stopped ever? Do you know anybody who's gotten angry and just never stopped being angry ever? Do you know anybody who, you know, like, so kind of help help them wake up to the unconscious belief systems that this is life or death. This is forever. I'll never stop. Like, no, people do stop. And then once you work through this enough and tolerate it enough, then you come to this other place where you find a way to resolve it. And I I can't tell you right now what that looks like. That's something for you to discover for yourself. Um, But you will find some resolve. Okay, so the five steps to healing quickly one more time is accept the deep pain of realizing you're not to blame, you are innocent and deserve protection. Two is allow yourself to grieve, and you grieve what didn't happen as much as what did happen. Shift responsibility to where it belongs with the people in your life um, who were responsible for causing pain. And take responsibility for create, number four, take responsibility for creating love, connection, and safety for yourself. And then number five, continue to invest in tolerating difficult feelings, ambivalence, loss of time, um, and also like joy and, and excitement. And some people really have a hard time letting themselves be happy and letting themselves relax and letting themselves not know what's going to happen in the future, but trust themselves to move forward. So all that's encompassed in number five. So we're helping them build a paradigm, a new paradigm, a paradigm that they're lovable and that they're loving, that they belong, that they matter, that they can take up space in this world, and that they are not afraid of themselves or anyone else ever again. All right, I hope you found this helpful and gives you some ideas on how to help your clients move forward, how to help your clients connect with um, the grief that they need to connect with and so that they can reorganize that paradigm within them and create the life that they're looking for that they really want. If you would like more support and help and knowing how to help your clients, I do have the Art of Healing Trauma. It's an incredible 12-week program where we work together. Not only do you get certified in the trauma model, but you get we really dive into the detail of this is just one pillar of many within the trauma model and it's really how to help our clients genuinely, truly move through it, regardless of their diagnosis, regardless of what they've been through. Um, And what I love about the trauma model is that it it pairs so well. So if you are EMDR, if you are into EFT, whatever your modality is, you can use it with this. So if you are trained in EMDR, you can use EMDR to help them tap into their grief, get into their grief. You can use EFT to help them tap through the grief. You know, so these are, it's just, it, it, I just love it because it goes, it partners so well with your point of view, with your modality of choice, and but it gives you a really good basic understanding. I call it the toolbox that you can put all of your tools in. It gives you a really solid framework on what's going on with people and why. So if this at all interests you, is something you want to work through, I'd love to work through it with you. The information's in, this, in the show notes. Um, 
Like I said, and you can get fully certified in the trauma model through the Ross Institute, um, along with learning all kinds of really cool, powerful tools to work with your clients. All right, I will see you later. See you next week.